over to you, Rita. All right. So very happy second day of Ramadan to all of us. And uh, we are very fortunate to have two very accomplished photographers whose work covers a lot of Middle East and Central Asia. So welcoming to, uh, Lorenzo Tonioli and Francesca Recchia. Together they have collaborated on a book called The Little Book of Kabul. And we would be going through a lot of images and stories uh, that revolves around their times in Kabul and Afghanistan. Lorenzo, uh, an Italian photographer, he's based in Beirut right now. And it's very interesting to go through his website. You could see a lot of depictions of his work from this region, from Central Asia. You'll see Syria, you'll see Yemen, you'll see Afghanistan. So very interesting snippets and stories. Uh, last year, he won Pulitzer for his coverage on humanitarian work on uh, 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 Yemen's work. And he has collaborated with multiple magazines like your New York Times, your Wall Street Journal. So very, very, you know, accomplished photographer. And on the other hand, we have Francesca Rekia. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm very amazed to see how you collaborate multiple discipline into your photographic work. So your academic pursuits in multiple universities, your Goldsmith or for example, Goldsmith or so as it, it's very interesting to see how your culture study, your Asian studies, your urban uh, planning related studies all comes together to your, you know, photographic work and your work in Afghanistan. So uh, we would be going through a lot of these works today. Uh, yeah, we can start now. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for that introduction. And uh, also, please do f uh, follow uh, Lorenzo on uh, Instagram. Uh, it's on your screen right now. And I'm sure you'll be updated with uh, everything that he does. And uh, a lot of inspiration to uh, get from his Instagram handle as well. So with that said, I will uh, stop my sh uh, screen share and I'll hand over the stage to Lorenzo and Francisco. Thank you so much, guys. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Francisco, do you want to wanna add something to this? Yeah, just a little clarification. I'm not a photographer. <laughs> I work, uh, I'm a writer. So uh, the photos that you'll be seeing are Lorenzo's photos. And we've been uh, working together, uh, collaborating on different media, but uh, I do not take photos. I just uh, well, I mean, I do for my own pleasure, but I would not call myself a photographer next to a Pulitzer Prize winner. So uh, I think you will hear from me the storytelling part and from Lorenzo, the more um, in-depth reflection on, uh, on photography itself. Yes. So, um, um, yeah, I wanted to, maybe I can introduce a bit of the idea of, of, uh, of this, uh, of this talk and uh, what are we exactly are we gonna be uh, dealing with here um, a sec. I'm gonna put you in this uh, can you see my screen now yeah it's very much visible Perfect. okay so um, uh, when I was invited to do this talk um, I um, well the idea was to talk about my uh, black and white photography and uh, the question that came into mind is why black and white photography? Obviously black and white photography is, uh, is not, uh, is, is not necess necessary at the moment, meaning that uh, black and white photography has an historic uh, background uh, it's, uh, it was the only technology available for a while and then it was used especially by photojournalists uh, for a period of time because it was the fastest uh, medium because at the time photographers and photojournalists were traveling and were developing their own films on, uh, on, on site and then, shoot, and then sending the images from there and obviously using uh, uh, using, uh, I'm talking about the, the era before, uh, before the digital, what was happening is that uh, black and white photography was needed because of, uh, it's much easier to develop uh, black and white and, and uh, photographers can do it themselves while color cannot be done in that way. So the question is why am I still doing black and white photography? What's mm, 
what's the point of doing it now when we have digital photography and and uh, obviously the picture are being taken in color and then converted. Uh, so when I asked myself this question, I uh, quickly realized that I didn't know the answer. <laughs> and so I, um, I thought that maybe um, instead of just going through my work and simply uh, explaining you why uh, I did this work, I would like to talk about this with Francesca. Uh, why Francesca? Francesca, has, uh, Francesca is, a, is a writer, is a, is a researcher, she's working on the cultural practices in uh, areas of conflict for many years, uh, especially in research and in uh, teaching or setting up various schools around <laughs> the two continents. Um, uh, uh, so, she definitely has, first of all, uh, a, a, much, a much more um, clear understanding of, of these of cultural practices. And, and also, of course, because Francesca has been important for my uh, development as a photographer, because um, we, again, we collaborated on a book that um, was shot in Kabul. Uh, and, um, and then most recently, uh, uh, this year we collaborated on a story, work on a story again in Afghanistan. I lived in Afghanistan for, uh, so again, so this is uh, about a, a bit of my, um, my path into photography, into black and white photography, and of course this is related to my life and what's uh, with the places that I, I spent, the, the places that I photographed more and to focus uh, more, uh, we wanted to, we want to like focus on uh, Afghanistan and, uh, and we're gonna talk about a bit what we did together in Afghanistan, what I did together and what kind of like how um, various uh, adventures took me there. Uh, to give a bit of background, I moved to Afghanistan uh, in 2010 and I lived there for uh, around four years and a half. Uh, and uh, while well, Francesca joined me a bit later, when was it, Francesca, that you arrived? It was 2000, uh, the end of 2011. And uh, so Francesca joined me um, a bit later uh, and uh, she's still there. <laughs> she, well, now she's in Milan, I think, but she is now the director of a really important and prestigious school uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, but um, again, so she's still there. I've been kind of uh, left in 2015 and I've been out of Afghanistan for around three years. And then last year I came back and uh, of course it was natural to keep working with Francesca. Um, um. Just, uh, so Lorenzo and I started collaborating quite randomly. Uh, and what turned out in, uh, to be a many year long co collaboration was initially meant uh, just for a short article that we were uh, commissioned. And it was uh, an article that was commissioned almost as a, a challenge or a gamble because we were asked to write for Domus, that is, uh, an Italian uh, magazine on um, architecture and design about uh, what was the cultural landscape of Afghanistan. And obviously, from a um, superficial Western perspective, everyone thought that there was nothing to look for, because I mean, I could very well go, but there was nothing that I would find. Uh, and at that point, Lorenzo and I st started working together, and uh, then we'll get to it a little later. From that collaboration, then uh, the book, uh, I mean, from that accidental act uh, article, then uh, the book came out. Uh, but uh, let's, let's get back to, to the yeah. black and white. Yeah. Uh, so, well, that's interesting. So basically, that's actually, well, this is a series of images that I want to show now, and just landscapes of, uh, of Afghanistan. This first image actually I just checked before, it was taken in 2010. So it's interesting that it's 10 years ago and that he's uh, before 
Francesca. So it's kind of like, it makes sense to, to, to tell the story. So one, what I was doing now at this point in Afghanistan um, was, uh, I was, um, I, I arrived in Afghanistan, I started doing uh, work for uh, um, mostly NGOs or government uh, development agencies. Uh, and, um, and then slowly, uh, probably around later, like 2012, um, I started uh, working also with newspaper, uh, and I especially started working a lot with, uh, with the Washington Post, that is still my main client now. Um, so why black and white? Why am I showing you this, uh, these landscapes? Uh, this, I, I, uh, this series, I call it surface, and it's, it's because it's about looking at the surface of the actual country. Uh, um, at the time, what I was doing, I was uh, working a lot for NGOs and I was uh, traveling a lot. I had the opportunity to travel a lot uh, in Afghanistan and, and sometimes it was airplane, sometimes it was helicopter. And, and, um, and so what I did, I um, eventually, took the pictures that I was taking at the beginning and at the end of my assignment, so the pictures were actually flying there or flying back, and, uh, and put together this right. project of uh, landscapes. Um, uh, it's interesting for me to show you landscapes because it was a challenge, because obviously my, uh, my uh, background as a photographer is about photographing people. And uh, the idea of putting together uh, like a body of work about only about landscapes was kind of like challenging and and well, what what I was fascinated here obviously was the the beauty of this place, but also uh, the the kind of uh, formal aspect of of these images. So most of the way these images are built are, are about the light, but also how the frame and the lines in the frame are kind of working together. So uh, most of it, most of the fascination that I have for these images is not much about what they depict, but this just the formal, uh, just the formal uh, aspect of it. Um, um, I, I'm, as, as you know, I'm very, very fascinated by this, this series of works. So something, you know, even though I wasn't it was before my time. I've always uh, uh, really loved it uh, uh, for two reasons. One is because it gives a very, um, so very truthful to Afghanistan, uh, but also, uh, and I would like you to comment on this. It seems to me very much uh, a meditation on the medium of photography. Yes, it's 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 uh, it's. Um... It, this was a time in which, uh, well, for the first time, I was getting a lot of work as a, photo, as a photographer, something that was unprecedented for me. But also, I was working in a country that I still didn't understand. And I have, uh, and I had the, the, I mean, I was, I knew, I knew that I, I'm trying to photograph, I'm trying to represent a place that I don't really know, I don't really have the, uh, the rights, in a way, to 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 say. In fact, like the idea of, of the of the landscape was like that's all we know, you know, like that's all we understand. As foreigners, we just fly in because uh, we just the, the the idea of like flying with an helicopter is because uh, uh, you know there are parts of the country that are controlled by the Taliban and the security rules in Afghanistan are really strict. So what most uh, foreigners see of this country, especially people who work uh, in developments, but also journalists, is like I mean, usually they live in a uh, in a in a secure place. So there are blast walls. There are like you know, the green zone kind of situation, and then they fly in. They like they fly in to a place, and 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 so what they see is like basically they see the country from the little window that is the car or that is their house or that is the helicopter. So at the time it was like, you know, that's all I can say about this country because I see, obviously I was meeting people, I was, but the, the way of, 
of showing this country was still, um, I didn't feel it was completely honest, uh, completely uh, so, so full. It's in very uh, contrast to what actually Afghanistan is, you know, like it looks so peaceful from above. Yes, uh, it's, uh, well, of course, it's, it's uh, this, this portrait, this, this, this landscape are about the, the, the beauty and, and the power of, of, of this place. There's also an interesting component about the, the distance, right? Because then, I mean, I don't want to anticipate too much, but a lot of the work that you've done uh, later is about being very, very close. And so I think that can also be understood as a progressive, um, in-depth, in uh, relation and connection to the country is that yes. so yes um, yes absolutely and in fact this is a, a body of work that I put together Ob obviously if you see the stuff about the, the kind of images that I produced before they are just normal images of photojournalism so uh, so whatever uh, so they, but obviously the, the people are at the center of this and uh, and when I put together this body of work, I was like a bit sad because of the work. I liked the work, but it was not what I was what have been trying to do for many years, you know. Um, so um, it was kind of a step back and say, okay, let's uh, let's try to to see what I can say about this place. And and um, and of course, the, the the chapter after this that is the the project that I did with you. Uh, uh, was a way to explore uh, Afghanistan, but again, keeping in mind what are we able to say, what we are uh, entitled to say about the place where we are foreigners, uh, and how we want to say it. Uh, uh, we are talking about, you know, 2011, 2012, uh, when we start collaborating, and these are years I would like to remind that uh, where it was a, uh, where the, the United States uh, Army mission was uh, at its peak. So most of the photographers, most of the photojournalists that were coming in at the time, they were embedding with the uh, with uh, with the U.S. soldier. They were going to places like Helmand uh, and uh, Kunduz or um, uh, Jalabad, places where there was like the height of the war. And, uh, and uh, of course, me as a young photographer, uh, I wanted to uh, see if I can instead do something that was uh, a bit outside of that kind of way of showing the, the camp. Um, and so uh, the collaboration that came together, uh, I think it was also about that. I mean, there were a lot of, uh, elements of the country that we know we didn't want in there um, and uh, and uh, we were looking for a representation of a place that was not you know, poverty, burka, uh, violated women rights, uh, war and, and but like to show that there were like uh, people that were also pas passionate about culture, about music, about design, about poetry and uh, and uh, well, what was happening at the time is that the U.S. intervention, maybe unwillingly in a way, it was uh, opening uh, doors for uh, some of these artists to uh, to express and to be uh, to be uh, doing what they like to do. I, I would like you to take it from here. I have a question here. Uh, what is the idea yeah. behind the title of the book? Why did you call Sorry. it the little book of Kabul? Yeah. Idea behind the title. Okay. Um, well, uh, there, are, there are a number of uh, more or less anecdotal version of the story around the title. Uh, so one, after we published the article that I was telling you about, uh, a dear friend of mine uh, said, you'll have to write a book about this. And 
uh, and then I went back to Lorenzo and I was, yeah, he says we need to write a book about this. And neither of us was at the beginning, and this is months before we actually started really serious, uh, seriously thinking that that would be a possibility. Uh, and then this very same friend, who was in fact uh, a Pakistani professor at Columbia University, uh, told, told us, yeah, 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 I also have the title for you. And the title was The Little Book of Kabul. Mm, initially, the idea was to publish with uh, um, an independent American publisher who um, was very keen on the title. Uh, and then that, uh, that thing fell through for a number of reasons. Uh, but the title stuck and in the end became very much uh, was very meaningful to the actual work that we were doing in the sense that um, uh, if, if, I, if I'm allowed for a little detour, uh, I think what, uh, one of the important things that uh, uh, I think we need to highlight here is the fact that both Lorenzo and I are very interested on, uh, on a notion of positionality. That is a reflection that in a moment like this, uh in a context like the covid is very important so where do you speak from where do you take your photograph from not not necessarily only just physically but also what is the background and the cultural um components that influence the the choices that uh you make as well as the the economic and uh, and social uh political uh, uh components so Speaking from this perspective, where you interrogate where you're writing from and where you're taking a photograph from, what we understood was that we were in no position to create an encyclopedia. And so the only thing that we could do well was to do something small that was uh, very, um, was done with great care, but with, uh, the ambition to be honest to the small details that we would encounter rather than create a theory around uh, creativity in Afghanistan. That's right, that's right. It's a very light-hearted title for a very strong content inside. Kind of a contrast in itself, yeah. Um, uh, so just going back to the kind of like themes uh, of, of this lecture, the idea was that so why did I do that black and white uh, series? It was because kind of like black and white for me uh, meant, or still means, a kind of a, a place that is not necessarily related to uh, the market because, um, I mean, I work with the, with the newspapers mostly and so I use color for my primary job and usually uh, what I uh, use the black and white for, uh, it's usually for personal projects or meaning places where I can uh, think about more about what I want from photography. Um, and now I want to make a question to Francisco. Why the, why the, the little book of travel was in black and white? Um, again, for us, it was, uh, I suppose, it was a matter of, uh, of time and timing. Because, uh, um, as Lorenzo said, uh, this book was very much what we wanted to do. And the reason why we also, uh, the, the collaboration with the publisher fell through is, was because they didn't want what we wanted. Um, at that point, we weren't prepared to. Can I show? Can I show? Can I start showing the pictures? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, I mean, just a little, uh, um, just to make you feel a little special. It's the first time that we are showing all the pictures of the book. We've yeah. never done it, so you'll see the entire selection of photographs. You see um, the edit, and you see it in the order in which it appears in the book. Yeah, so uh, as Lorenzo said, for him, black and white was the medium that would uh, be truthful to his own 
uh, personal interest and his own uh, photographic research. And the kind of writing that is in the book is the same for me. Uh, I do, I prefer to do short form uh, non-fictional narrative. And that uh, was the space that the book, uh, for, the book was the space for me to experiment with that. Um, as Lorenzo said, uh, historically photographers would do black and white uh, because they could do everything by themselves. And uh, to quote Lorenzo, everything in the book is uh, Afghan, including the water that uh, we used to develop uh, the, the film. And then I'll leave it to you to continue. Um, yeah, so I, I, first of all, the difference between these images and the one you saw before is that before you were seeing digital images uh, that were have been converted in black and white. Well, this is uh, this is film. This is a uh, Leica M6 with the Triax film, and we are we like you know how. So there are uh, so in, in a way I, I kind of like I mean at the time my idea was to completely separate my work as a photo as a photojournalist uh, like a, for. Uh, um, for, for the market and then and my personal project and so I was shooting literally with two different cameras and two different medias and like two different systems uh, so I was shooting in in, uh, in uh, digital uh, and color for my assignments and I was shooting black and white film for uh, well in this case the group um, the and of, of course like uh, well, I'm not really old, but I'm old enough to have started with the, uh, with the film photography. So, I mean, like the, my first assistant job was actually developing and, and doing contact sheets and, uh, and uh, uh, in the bathroom with a photographer. Um, uh, so, uh, I had the kind of a simple knowledge that need, there is needed to do this. And, and so, I did it. And... Uh, and and so I, what I did, I I brought the films in in Kabul, and then I developed it there, and then we uh, actually did everything there. We did. Uh, I had a, like legal scanner, um, uh, so we actually like made uh, proofs and and start playing it around uh, my bedroom uh, to see the whole thing, and and then we start putting the editing together. Um, the 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 idea of the book, we need to say that the idea of the book was, uh, was to collaborate all the way between me and Francesca, meaning that Francesca would write short stories, I would uh, compile my photo essay, but the way we actually put that in together, uh, obviously there is something that is missing here, uh, is to use the images and the short stories uh, as part of an edit. So basically the short story we actually like made a little picture like with the name of the short story and in so in order that the short story and the edit is kind of like talking of course you don't see that here but that's important uh, uh, so that that's that's where that's where we did and then of course we did the whole uh, post processing of everything we did the uh, uh, the text we did the, the, the graphic design and just Let me interrupt because I think we took for granted uh, one step and then we'll get to the rest because uh, I think it's also relevant to this context. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't say what the book is about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I suppose you're, you're sort of imagining or understanding from, from the images, but what we did was to follow uh, for one and a half years uh, a number of cultural practitioners in uh, in Kabul. Uh, the main uh, protagonist then became uh, uh, an indie rock band, the Kabul Dreams. Uh, now you see Suleiman's uh, favorite uh, pedal. Uh, then uh, huh? over an Afghan carpet. Over an That's over an Afghan carpet. That's the recording studio. Yeah, that we helped set up physically because it was in a back room of a cafe and didn't yeah. have insulation. So we had to bring in wood and try and make it 
um, soundproof. Then the other protagonist was the Center for Contemporary uh, Arts in Afghanistan. Uh, I suppose the next picture is about yeah. that. This is the office of the director in, uh, this building doesn't exist anymore. It's been torn down since then. Uh, it was a little quaint old house in, um, in a garden in uh, West Kabul. And then um, the other uh, protagonist was uh, an interior designer with whom, um, uh, and, and carpet designer with whom we had um, a very intricate uh, personal relation. He was our landlord at some point. And we did for him another book on, on his work called uh, Afghan uh, Interiors. Uh, and then along with them, there were uh, a number of other people with whom we interacted, including um, uh, individual painters, uh, the National Theatre, uh, puppet makers. So um, basically what we did was to spend one and a half years every day with the people who then became the protagonists of the book. And one of the things that may make the book really special is the fact that the distinction between uh, private and professional became really blurred. So we started spending uh, birthdays together, hanging out uh, for iftar, considering that now is Ramadan, we spend more, many iftars together. Um, or, uh, you know, we will reach out to one another to ask for advices around uh, many different things. And then there is Kabul, the city itself. And then there is the city. I have a question, Francesca. So it seems that uh, you adopted a very ethnographical approach towards your um, research and uh, spending time with them, taking pictures. So along the way, when did the picture happen? While you were interviewing and spending time, you were, all, were you also taking pictures at the same time? Or how did that happen? How was the process like? Uh, I do not do ethnography because I don't think of the people I interact with as the objects of my research. Uh, Lorenzo and I worked constantly together and that was also a deliberate uh, choice. Uh, there are writers and uh, photographers who do research separately and then uh, sit at the table later and compare notes. We did not do that. and. Um, the fact that uh, the research was uh, so extensive and as I just said became very blurred, the personal and the professional, made it so that um, it was just very organic. It wasn't a moment of taking picture and then a moment of hanging out. It was just we were there and uh, I rarely uh, took notes that uh, made like infuriated Lorenzo because he thought that I would forget things but for me it was a matter of being uh, in the present and uh, as Lorenzo said he took photos with the Leica that is a very small unintrusive uh, camera so that was always hanging on his neck and and so even the taking pictures didn't become uh, there was nothing staged and nothing uh, prepared uh, and nothing uh, programmed in neither the pic the kind of pictures that we would take nor in the kind of interactions that we would have. So it wasn't about interviewing people, quite rarely in fact, it was just spending time together. Um, uh, yeah, I would, I, would add, I would like to add something. Like in general, what, I mean, the, the, the plus of uh, working with uh, uh, this, this uh, small group of artists that live uh, and and uh, and living in the same city as them, because I mean, as I mean, the difference between this work and other uh, body of work that I put together is that um, I, I was living in Kabul, so I was, I mean, in this year, uh, that uh, is year and a half, as Francesca is mentioning, we were both in living there, and so uh, we kind of established a relation with the with the. Um, with, with some of these artists, uh, 
this is a band uh, called Kabul Dreams. And, and so what was happening is that uh, um, after a while, they were, they, we just know that they, uh, for example, here they are recording a music video for their, for one of their songs. So they just invited saying, you know, uh, we are doing this, uh, you wanna come over? Or uh, you know, during the the span of this, during this time, mostly we followed them uh, recording their first of all, first setting up the studio. But then the idea was to <laughs> to uh, uh, record their first album. So uh, you know, when they were rehearsing, they would tell us uh, when if they were doing a concert or if they were recording a video. And the same for for uh, for other artists. The, some of the pictures you saw before was from the School of Contemporary Art, um, and so they would tell us what kind of, you know, if they were doing an exhibition, actually there's gonna be a picture of one of their exhibition, because uh, they had students and they, they were doing final year exhibition as any school in the world. Um, and, uh, and also, we need to say that we ended up as uh, kind of collaborating with most of these, um, artist uh for example in the, in the school of contemporary art i end up teaching photography uh francesca ended up doing this uh uh course in contemporary art because there's not much of a there was still not much of a uh knowledge uh, among the artists why don't you go back to arifa's picture because i think uh, that uh i can look for it arifa, arifa. I think that gives a sense. We we just passed it. You got it. Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean, that does just to, to, I think you need to speak about this one because you didn't take it with uh, like a long lens from 15 kilometers away. And this is very... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, this is, this was taken in the main space of the school. That was a kind of a, Anger, kind of like uh, like a building made of this metal and corrugated thing, it was really cold there in the winter, and it was really hot in the summer. This guy, kind of like not really, but I mostly remember the cold actually. Whatever. So, um, about the students, uh, well, what, what was uh, interesting? Many things were interesting, but one of the things that were interesting about this school is that they were. Uh, female and male students they were working together and there was uh, and there was like kind of experimenting also on uh, uh, any kind of uh, medium so photography and, and painting and sculpture in fact you are uh, there was also another picture in which you saw these two uh, girls that were like putting together some kind of a uh, piece uh, anyway so here uh, we went there many times and then I was and also because you know you have this beautiful light coming in from the side and and I was keep saying to Francesca we should go back there we should go back there because it's like you know you have this beautiful light and and there is all these students doing things which was interesting uh, what was happening here is that actually this uh, young woman is uh, posing for a portrait in fact if you look closely on the left you even see a kind of a uh a lens you should see a little like darkened but it's, it's a little dark but you see a lens uh, poking in from the left and she's posing for uh, a colleague artist another artist who's uh who's doing a project and um and, and he's doing portraits with various uh uh attires um but uh, yes yeah, so actually arifa is a is a painter and uh, and she was there doing her painting, but then she asked, she was asked by this friend to, to pose, and and uh, and this is why she's wearing this is a this is a burka that has been uh, uh, taken back. So, so and this is why also she's so um, I imagine she's so relaxed and and um, and of course the, 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 we need to say that you know in Afghanistan. Uh, it's 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 quite unusual to, to to be able to take picture of women, young women, that distance because I mean this is a 35 millimeters, so I'm like a meter and a half away, and she obviously know that I'm there, um, and uh, and uh, and so it it was interesting because you know like these are people that know me, that know that they kind of have a trust in me, and also the weird thing that I want to add is that uh, the fact that was. Film photography uh, kind of helped us getting access 
uh, many times because it has the feeling that you know, this picture is not made for Facebook or is not made for uh, uh, a quick publication, but is made for something that um, it's ha has a diff has a different kind of a uh, lens or like on the storytelling. Yeah, I think that that again, that's that that's the notion of the the kind of time that we invested is also, it's it's true throughout the the process. So, mm -hmm. in, yeah. Did you find any difference while photographing women of other Middle Eastern cultures and Afghanistan? Like we find it very difficult to approach, and because you lived with them them for one and a half years, maybe that would have eased. Process, but otherwise, was it easy or tough? Um, no, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not it's not no much difference. I mean, I think it's like uh, uh, of course there are places like Lebanon that is much less conservative uh, for any religion uh, uh, than than Afghanistan, but. Uh, um, or even Libya, I've been working around Libya recently, and, and uh, you know, women don't necessarily wear a veil there. Um, but um, no, I don't. I don't think it's. I mean, I think I think it's generally a matter of trust. It's a matter of understanding what uh, what uh, what's the situation. I mean, like you know, if you if you have a woman that doesn't want to be photographed, uh, there are many reasons. So you need to understand. Uh, what is the reason? So in general, the reason can be because she didn't go to the hairdressers that day. That actually happened to me in Iran. This is not about religion. It's just because she she didn't feel like she she was like beautiful enough to be part of a picture. Two, she actually putting her life in danger doing that because you know there are uh, places in Afghanistan in which uh, women can get in danger because they show their face and they let a partner photograph. Them. Uh, so, first of all, you need to understand what, why, and and then uh, you have to you have to make them understand and like have some kind of trust, you know. Uh, so, the moment in which there is an understanding of the situation and there is trust, uh, then it's not about you know it's the same. I mean, you just have to understand because like obviously women they they don't want to be photographed for, for a reason. We've been quite free flowing. So if there are questions or comments, we are happy to take uh, any. Because I mean, we can go on forever. So just <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure uh, they'll come in as and when they have questions. Mm -hmm. so this is the, this is uh, the, the, during a play. So this is the audience of a play. In the in one of the buildings of the Ministry of Culture. Yeah, it's um, the, the main hall of the Ministry of Information and Culture. I was fascinated by this painting. And this is another one of the rooms when I was saying, let's go back, let's go back, because you know, you see all these artists working and this light coming in. So I obviously I was fascinated by this uh, situation in, in which you see all this uh, activity going on. And the portrait that you see at the center is the self portrait that the lady that Lorenzo photographed was oh, painting. Yes. Yeah, it's true. That's actually the same. The side of Afghanistan we don't usually get to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a kind of a, a bit of a, the idea of the book. It was just, especially at that particular time, because, uh, yeah, of course, you had, uh, I mean, 2014, uh, Afghanistan means you know, Taliban, Bin Laden, uh, and you know, and everything else, and Americans kicking doors. So uh, this is a, this is an actor that is taking a break. I think it's the same building. It's a, I think it's still that the Ministry of uh, is a blast wall in it's in the background. The Ministry of now it's covered in plastic, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and this is one of the buildings that uh, the designer that we were following, Rahim, is uh, is uh, is uh, is making. It is actually his own mansion, and uh, he was like 
uh, experimenting with the traditional uh, architecture or traditional way of building. So this is mud and cement and and you have these amazing craftsmen that are working with him. Um, and yeah, he had a really interesting way of working that is uh, particular. And uh, yeah, and this is the the actual uh, editing of the of the album. Or I don't know, they're probably, I mean, they are listening to a track. So this is where you see uh, Suleiman that is so concentrated because he's intensively listening to the track that they just recorded. So my uh, uh, small anecdotal fact is that, uh, as I said earlier, you know, Lorenzo and I could go on forever. And that was also the case for the book, because once you establish a relation so personal and so deep with the people who then end up in the book, it becomes very difficult to understand. You know where you started, but you don't know how to put an end on, on the research, because, you know, it's it's an ongoing story, so how do you say that you're done? And we, we couldn't find an answer to that question because, you know, there wasn't a timeline from within us that could tell us when to stop. Uh, so we decided that uh, to give us uh, a pace and to give us a, a sense of conclusion of the sort of journey that we were doing with with all these people was uh, to end when the album of Couple Dreams would be released. So our last day of research was the day of the first concert for the launch of uh, Plastic Words, that is the, book, the, the album of Couple Dreams. Mm. And there is an image later you're going to see. It. So was Couple Dreams the key protagonist? Yes, it's one of the four uh, protagonists uh, of the book. This is again the same anger, and actually that's the same painting, I think. Yeah, that goes it really that looks like the, the same. Back. That's the back of the, the back. painting. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yes, this is the main hall of the School of Contemporary Art. As you see, it's like mud wall or like cement wall, and and metal and yeah. Was the Are conflict uh, coming? Was the conflict on during this time when you're doing this project? Oh yeah. In the city? Um uh, well uh, yes. Um yes. I mean uh, actually this was a moment uh, well yeah I mean in terms of warriors that was much 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 uh, I mean the the bombs in, in Kabul um were uh, usually um, aimed at uh, the Americans or the Afghan security forces. Um, the kind of uh, civilian, like the, the kind of bombs, mass uh, bomb, mass casualty bombs in against civilians that started in Afghanistan mostly when, when ISIS came in. But yes, so at the time there was obviously that's the height of the war. I mean, the Americans are, like we are talking about uh, 100,000 uh, NATO soldiers. This is the peak of the war. Uh, so that was the biggest mission of the United Nations in history. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So, sorry, just to, to clarify, the book ended in, in 2014. And as Lorenzo said, 2014 is quite a year for Afghanistan in the sense that, uh, a year prior to that, the Americans announced that they would draw uh, their troops. So there was this escalation in both tension and uh, violence in preparation to the withdrawal of the troops. Uh, also, while we were there, there, were, uh, there was uh, a general presidential election. Uh, so that always uh, creates uh, a fair amount of tension in the country. So, uh, you know, whether much uh, there is a rhetoric of a one of a one war, Afghanistan is still very much a country that is undergoing a ridiculous amount of violence. So, it's very difficult to extrapolate any anything from that uh, daily violence. And so that was also for us 
why the sort of meditative pace of working was important because you know when you do war reporting or when you write about war you write always about that particular moment that changed everything whereas we were talking about things that in that particular space and time did not change that was you know the painting the making music the yeah. hanging out and so that was also in terms of uh narrative tools very important for us a parallel yeah, life yeah. keeps running yeah i wanted to add like for example this uh this is a image of of a paint that i like the, the that was taken inside the studio of the paint uh, the, the two bedroom uh, but for example, he, I remember the, the conversation that we were having with him and he was uh, pretty scared about uh, the future of his country and he was uh, pretty scared about just going out. I mean, like, you know, if you are a painter, you just know more like you're killed by a bomb like, crossing the road. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, in fact, he ended up leaving the country and, uh, and uh, yeah, we have to say that basically, uh, we kind of like you know we the book it's is this year this is like kind of slice of this year of time in the, the cultural scene of Kabul and uh, and uh, and obviously it's, it's not the same now and 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 it's kind of like also because that was the the last year in which the Americans would have been like a direct uh, uh, role in in the country uh, from then on the whole the whole everything changed so most of the all of the, I think, all of the, yeah. uh, the, the, the people that you see here left the country. Uh, but the, the, the director of the Center for Contemporary Art who came back, to, to be okay. fair. But Everything. anyway, so at a certain point, most of the people who are doing what you can see here, they just left. And uh, the Kabul dreams are out, Rahim is out, everybody's out. So, um, you know, that it was a moment in which, like, this cultural scene had a kind of a hope and a kind of enjoyment like here this is a this is a music festival in which you have like uh, skaters and uh, graffiti artists and obviously band playing and 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 it was like you know like we are young and we want to like have fun <laughs> and and uh, and that's so it was I mean the, the book is interesting also because it's kind of like it's a portrait of this moment of time and it's kind of the high of the hopes and then after 2015, when the American uh, kind of stopped doing missions uh, there, uh, but just kind of like supported in, uh, with the, the, keep supporting the government. But like, you know, most of what happened there is not only about the Americans, it's about the international kind of uh, uh, money and, and developments and an interest in the country. Because what happened, I mean, like, uh, I was just having, uh, I was just doing an interview before this and it was like, oh, you work in Afghanistan, I mean, like, congratulations, I mean, like, who cares about Afghanistan, <laughs> like, we never heard, I mean, it's, in fact, what happened is like, you know, after, because many people after 2015, they didn't hear of what's going on in Afghanistan, because when the American troops left, I mean, I'm talking about a big number of the American troops left, and so you stop having American casualties, you stop having an interest of what's happening there. So, yeah. Also, without us uh, knowing at that time, what the book has become is very much a historical document of a very peculiar moment in the history of the city of Kabul that is no longer there. Yeah. Things have changed uh, in many, many ways, and uh, they're not they're not as they were when we did the book. So things like this, uh, this is a, a contemporary yeah. art uh, exhibition that was open to the public, that was um, publicly uh, advertised. Those things now are not happening as much. The contemporary art community has really thinned. Uh, many people for various reasons and in various ways have left. Those who are still there live a very, uh, like a more introvert uh, life. And also because of the changed situation, both in uh, financial terms and in terms of security, there are no spaces for uh, 
uh, contemporary art exhibitions any longer. Uh, one of our dear friends who's, um, who's a contemporary artist uh, is an Afghan-American artist. His name is uh, Aman Mojadidi. He's, he lives in uh, Paris. He described retroactively uh, this period of time as the last attempt of Western forces to, to try and win a war that they didn't win with weapons. So the influx of money to try and and do what uh, many conservative people uh, in Afghanistan would call a westernization of the youth uh, was through financing uh, rock bands and uh, film screenings and uh, photography sessions and contemporary art. And so all of a sudden everyone was the first female graffiti artist, the first female rapper, the first female a uh, rock band or you name it. And so it was a very uh, exciting, but also quite artificial uh, bubble that uh, we, in a sense, without, as I said, knowing contained uh, in the book. Francisca, can you explain this picture? Uh, this is... We be we've been back there recently. We've been back there recently. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a hidden gem of Kabul. Not many people know that this place exists. This is the, uh, the seat of the National Theatre. Mm, it was destroyed, was closed, was abandoned. And this uh, was the very first phase of restoration. And when we went there, they said, oh, within three months, it's going to be ready. We went there last year, that is five years old, and it was still kind of in the process of being restored. What is amazing about this photo is that it shows something that a viewer is not meant to see. Uh, what you see on your uh, right is a rotating um, theater stage. Uh, so what you see on your right is the stage of the theater and the photo is taken from the top uh, stool of the, the theater, so looking down. This uh, is one of the very few surviving rotating stages in the world uh, that was built with a very sophisticated German technology that now no one knows how to to operate anymore. So the fear is that something that is of a very significant uh, historical importance may disappear because this will be covered by a wooden stage and hidden underneath. It's not going to be dismantled because it's too expensive even to dismantle, but it's not going to be visible anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's Russian, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the whole thing. No, no, German. It's a very rare German technology. The the no, architecture the is was, some kind, huh? The, the building was built during the Russian during the Russian invasion. The building, yes, was uh, designed. Russian occupation. It's a proper brutalist uh, building. Yeah. Yes. Of which I'm very passionate about. Yes, yeah, so this is the same uh, space that I was saying I really like. That people can see it. Yeah. So as you can see, you know, the conditions in which this, this artist worked was quite challenging. As Lorenzo said, very cold in the winter and, and, and very, very hot uh, in, uh, in summer. What you see on, on the roof is potato sacks that were used to decorate the space for an exhibition because otherwise there was uh, a corrugated uh, tin roof. Yeah. And here it was really cold. In fact, everybody's wearing a, like a coat. And the very first, uh, in the foreground, there is actually a heater. Like, yeah, the gas heater it was so smelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is it. Um, so this is this was taken in what, what's it what's the name of the theater? The, the French Cultural Center. The French Cultural Center, uh, and yeah, this was the presentation. So maybe while well, we see the last few pictures of the the, um, 
the book, Lorenzo, maybe you want to say something about the the post-production and the printing, because I think that becomes a very, like a very yeah. peculiar challenge to shooting in black, in black and white. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, so again, this was one of those uh, adventures in which like you decide that is not, you know, it's not about the money and it's not about, you're not even try to make, <laughs> you're not gonna even try to, go even um, uh, because we wanted to uh, well the, the, the kind of like uh, graphic design approach to the book was 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 a bit challenging because it's it's always difficult to um, have a book that is can that can be readable uh, as a book uh, like as, as a novel or, uh, or as a book short, or short stories in this case uh, and, and a book of photography, because usually you have like a bigger format for a book of photography and, and, a, and a format that you can actually hold uh, in your lap if you want to read it uh, comfortably. And also about the paper. Um, so uh, anyway, after much research, um, we found this, uh, this uh, printer in Italy that, obviously, that then we find out was uh, is one of the best printer uh, in the world. In fact, we were printing the slot uh, just uh, uh, before, just before today. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a place that is in Verona, it's in the northeast of Italy. And, and is, uh, um, it's kind of like, it wasn't, it's a family business. That then the, the, the kids, the, the children took over and kind of transformed into this uh, kind of elite uh, printing press. So yeah, and, and of course, that, and they are they are specialized in in, uh, in uh, black and white printing, and they did uh, like the the the, 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 the ink exactly for the for the book, and 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 uh, and you know this is this uh, book was kind of challenging also for the printing also because as you can see the images are quite dark and 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 it's uh, it's always a bit of a uh, challenge to for, to like print pictures that are so dark but at the same time don't kill the blacks I mean don't uh, uh, lose all the details in the, in the shadows so it was kind of like you know and obviously we went there and obviously we didn't know anything about <laughs> making books so of course it was a great experience also just the fact of learning so much stuff about what's what are all the different elements that go into printing a book uh, how much more time do we have so that we can? Uh... I think I think it's like yeah, like twenty minutes maybe. Hmm? We are good. We are good. Uh, you can take your own time. <laughs> yeah, this is the same thing as before. Yeah, uh, yeah. I will go a bit faster. Yeah, we are. We are. We are at the end. Yeah. Actually, I just noticing now how many pictures of audience I have here. <laughs> this is the this is an I mean this is a really young audience. This is a, um, a performance of the mini theater, mini uh, circus of uh, Kabul and these are kids that are kind of climbing the trees to get to see the performance because we're all people. But uh, I kind of isolated this you know uh, motifs of, uh, of uh, lights and darks that I like. Uh, this is the recording of a music video. Uh, and the palace is, uh, the, mm, this is the Rulaman Palace, and is, uh, already show, I already show it uh, at least twice in, 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 uh, in here. Uh, and uh, it was this fantastic place that uh, now has been renovated. It looked like they, they, they made it yesterday. Um, but uh, it's a place that had it, uh, they have a lot of uh, history because these fighting these like bombs and uh, uh, bullet holes are mostly from from the civil war um, so not from the war that we were living at the time but um, anyway it was a really important uh, uh, historical place and, uh, and here they were just using it as a set for uh, for uh, for the music video okay Okay, fast forward, uh, what I want to show you now, it's uh, 
what's happening now. Um, and what, uh, the time in between is the story that I uh, did with Francesca, that we did together uh, last year. Um, so, uh, again, personally, what happened to me is that after 2015, I wanted to move back to the Middle East. I'm staying back because I have worked in the Middle East before and I wanted to go back. Um, so, uh, I kind of left Afghanistan and it was also like, you know, a good, a good idea. I think it's like, it's best to like, uh, no, I mean, because I've been living there for five years and so it was, uh, interesting also to cover other stuff and also to take a break from, from, uh, from Afghanistan. And so, uh, but what happened last year is that I decided to go back to Afghanistan and, uh, and, um, and of course, Francesca was, uh, the person I would uh be working with because uh because <laughs> she knows a lot so um so we did this um what uh the, the work um so what i wanted to do i mean this is kind of like um much later and this is maybe with the more of a photojournalistic like for most from around the eye of photojournalistic and the story the story is um uh, is about the displaced uh, people that are uh, that are fleeing the countryside, uh, the, the areas where there, there is active uh, combat, and they are coming to Kabul. Um, in, around Kabul, there are many many refugee camps, and uh, uh, that last fantastic no, in the, in the, the winter of 2019, the fantastic February of 2019, I spent it going around for. Uh, and a bunch of uh, refugee camps in, in Kabul, and uh, yeah, that's how it looks like. Um, it's not a nice place to be. Uh, <laughs> okay, so but what's important here, what's interesting to, to like say is about uh, what's the situation now. So, of course, these are people uh, that are coming from most of the time the countryside, they uh, are escaping because. Uh, they, again, that is, uh, they are escaping from the areas where there is actual fighting, but um, not all of them, they are new, uh, new refugees, new displaced, um, because again, this war has been going on for 10, more than 10 years, uh, the displaced have been uh, moving for this amount of time. So in these camps that, uh, as you can see, they are not, they are no longer tents, they are like kind of buildings. Um, they, um, there are people who have been who arrived here two months ago, one week ago, or people who have been here for 10 years. Um, and uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, uh, in the camps and the idea was to, um, to kind of like give more of a human, uh, uh, perspective on, on uh, what's the life that uh, our idea was to focus on the life of a, of a uh, particular person and this is uh, Halvibi and her uh, daughter and, um, and, uh, and so our story was mostly about her experience uh, yeah so I think uh, just a little step back is that um, when you talk about, uh, especially in the last couple of years, when you talk about internally displaced people in Afghanistan, you talk about hundreds of thousands of people. So there is um, a constant narrative about humanitarian emergency and the huge numbers of, of people moving around. And our fear was that however much is important to stress on, this, uh, on the numbers is that we, this kind of uh, storytelling would make the actual people that make those numbers disappear. And so if you say hundreds, you know, hundreds of thousands, then you don't think human yeah. beings anymore. You think statistics. And for us, that was, that was the kind of rhetoric that we wanted to challenge. Uh, and so we, and I mean, I'm not discrediting the importance of reporting, you know, the facts as they are, but I think that kind of uh, reporting needs to be complemented by stories of a humankind that lets you understand what it actually means for a person who 
could be you uh, to live in this kind of situation. And so when we met Khalbibi, we thought that her story was both uh, incredibly tragic as an individual story, but also sadly representative of the story of many people. Unfortunately, uh, I think uh, today uh, with the COVID situation, I think the same thing is happening again. We are all looking at numbers and not realizing that it's actually yeah. humans. So many of them, you know, losing their life every day. It mm -hmm. just becomes statistics. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add something about these both. I mean, that the, the woman that you see in, in, in the center uh, is Kalvidi, and and uh, she's uh, and it's kind of like about telling her the story of what she does, and she's displaced, and she arrived in this uh, camp. Had uh, her uh, husband died in the bombing, and this uh, was one. The reason why she she, she escaped, um, but you see, she's washing clothes mostly for uh, richer Afghans, and and if you see in the background, that's uh, well in Afghan terms, rich people houses, um, and you see the end of the refugee camp, and you see the beginning of the actual city, and that's uh, and so uh, some of the people that live in the refugee camp are kind of servicing and uh, washing the clothes of. Uh, or wash or like working as labor for for the for the Afghans that live outside the camp, and this is kind of like in the in the um, board at the end of the camp. And uh, yeah, maybe Francesca, you want to talk about her and her story? Is it again her? Yeah, I mean uh, her story it's 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 quite uh, dramatic. So she uh, her house was bombed. The courtyard of her house was bombed. Uh, she was making lunch and a bomb fell outside her house and she survived with two children, but her husband and another child who was in the courtyard didn't survive. So she waited for, and I mean, what, what was uh, quite devastating about her story is that the sense of time of her narrative became very blurred because there was this whole, Mm, traumatic recollection of what happened that was very difficult to to place one after the other in in terms of hours or days so she managed to get her husband uh the the, the, the body of her husband and waited until someone at some point uh, managed to put her the children and the body of her husband on a truck that travel for an entire day uh, across the country to reach Kabul when where she she was brought through the kindness of others to someone who originally was from the same uh, village and so there is a photo that you've seen of her praying at a grave uh, and what she said is that she brought her husband with her because at least she had a grave to pray on and as I said, this is a, an incredibly uh, uh, sad and tragic story. And uh, it's the story of many, many people who are also very difficult to account for because, uh, you know, imagine a house that is bombed uh, and a young woman who has been possibly dependent on her husband. These women, these people do not, legally exist because they traveled without documents without any form of identification possibly without being literate so without having the the tools to reclaim what is their right which is you know basic medical services now her young uh, youngest was a boy when we met him was sick when we met them was sick but she didn't have as she was out of the system because of the lack of documents and identification and because she was newly arrived in a in a refugee camp she did not know how to go to the doctor and then she did not have money for medicines for the for the child uh so yeah it's, it's a it's an incredibly complicated situation that uh unfortunately is a common to many people and so we want that to come out that it's not just 
hundreds of thousands moving around an empty space, but are individual people with individual stories and individual sorrows that need to be, uh, to be known. Then uh, the other images that you see here is kind of like a more of an overview of what's the life of, I mean, the, the, the idea was that the story was uh, focused on her, but you can still have a sense of the daily life in, uh, in the camps than uh, uh, this is a moth. Uh, are the are these uh, shot with the film camera as well, or is it digital? The new so this is digital. This, this is digital. Uh, um, um, that has been converted. I mean, what happened after the book is that I decided. Well, it's it. There are many. There are many reasons. Like what's uh, what, what? One of the reason is that when in 2014, my feeling of digital photography is that uh, you the, the the kind of technology that was um, available at the time for digital photography was not uh, the. Uh, you, you you couldn't do black and white as you um, can do now, or you as you could do with, with film. So then I I I think that then I I kind of like explore more, and I saw that uh, you can do similar, you can uh, uh, get uh, similar uh, results also uh, in digital, especially if you are able to to look for the right thing. Uh, uh, the, the 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 film uh, film photography is obviously helping a lot because it has already a lot of uh, character in the way the image uh, the images are uh, coming out. While in uh, in digital, you definitely need to uh, work and have more of an understanding of what you want from the picture to to get something. At it. And my experience is with the with the, with the uh, with real black and white with the uh, analog uh, was really important for me. Okay, thank you. As Lorenzo mentioned, that uh, that la last winter was really really tough. Uh, there was a lot of snow, and you know a lot of so there is basic. Uh, humanitarian support, but it's really, really basic. I mean, some of these children don't even have socks. They have plastic slippers when they're lucky if they're not bare feet. Yeah. And it was ridiculously cold and there was snow up to our knees. And this is how, uh, you know, that they have a bathroom. I think there was a picture of that common bathroom that is just uh, a mud hut with a, a tent. Uh, and yeah. the the signal that there was someone inside is that the tent is open, is closed, or you keep the tent open to to make, let people know that, uh, or well, the curtain rather than the tent. Sorry, uh, to to tell people that uh, uh, the bathroom is is free. So yeah, there is a level of hardship that is very difficult to imagine. Oh yeah. Um, like I was laughing because of uh, there's a whole thing, there's a whole story about my shoes, about <laughs> in terms of why it happened there. Because obviously, you go in this really muddy place, first time you go with your like, boots, and uh, but I mean, it's so bad, and and uh, and so you get home, and basically, you spend a good amount of time cleaning the boots to actually bring the school back. Uh, but then I saw these kids with this rubber boots. And it's like, you know, the boots like the fisherman kind of thing. But, and they were only like, they were wearing these rubber boots and they were without, without socks. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm gonna do it like them. I mean, that's, uh, they, that's clever. And uh, so I did that and I went back with the rubber boots, but I didn't uh, realize that the rubber boots have no padding at all and they are really cold. So, I mean, if you go, in a warm lake with that boots is fine, but if you go into um, snow, in five minutes you are freezing your 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 um, your feet. So yeah, really tough, really tough for yeah, really tough for them. And actually, uh, most of these this is a this is the boy who is showing me the shrapnel. 
like the, the, the consequences of shrapnel. He was uh, transported to, to Kabul to be, to, to, be, to be at the hospital and then, um, and then, but obviously he was still uh, quite uh, uh, traumatized by what happened. And this is many the, of these, sorry, just to to in, uh, clarify, many of these uh, the the kid, uh, this kid, and many others were victims of the night raid that have restarted, and the uh, the the Americans deny. And the problem is that also from a reporting and a documenting point of view, it's very difficult because you know you have the evidence, but then you do not have the documents to support that evidence. Yeah. And so for us also verifying the, the actuality and the reality of the story we were writing was very difficult. Because yeah. you know, there are, these are people who may not, as I said, may not have documents, may not know exactly the name of the dead end road where they used to live. And so it becomes very, very problematic from, um, from like a, uh, how do you say, rigorous reporting point of view to tell mm -hmm. stories accurately and verify that uh, what you are told is actually the truth. Yeah. So what about well, the well, state of Like, uh, uh, just, I mean, just because of like uh, the, the, the last few pictures that you say, and these included, they are from the same camp where um, she was living that uh, it was called, uh, Ali or something, um, and uh, anyway, so what we did is like we went back many times to the place. We asked the same story. We asked the same question to a lot of different people, and that was trying to triangulate kind of like the the the, 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 the information. There was a question, right? From mm, yes, I just want to ask you: When were these taken? These photos? Uh, it's February two thousand nineteen. 19. Yeah, yeah because I'm, I'm coming from Lesbos, I'm sure you've heard of it, the island where the Moria refugee camp of is now at the moment. And yes, it's exactly, because I've been in this camp, I have visited it with my camera, and it's exactly the same situation. And it's very sad to see, you know, that people, these people, Afghans, because this camp is uh, mainly comprised by Afghans and Syrians, leaving these conditions to go uh, to Europe for, yeah. to find something better. And eventually, still facing the same exact conditions, staying in tents under snow, rain, uh, truly filthy conditions, kids with the kids and everything. It's really, really sad. I didn't know, I, I was not aware about this actually, that there were internally displaced refugees within Afghanistan, there was a refugee camp. I was not aware of that. Yeah, uh, what's, what's interesting, what can be said is that like uh, there are um, usually displaced uh, people, they have a history of displacement. Um, like uh, what happened is that you, if you live in, uh, I don't know, a, a region in Helmand that is in the south, what will happen is that you will, uh, because the front line comes too close to your house and can stay there for months, you will eventually move. Um, and, and if you move and if the, this, this uh, fighting in that particular area keep going, you will like you will not go back you will try to go to the biggest provincial capital that in that case uh is Vashkarga in Erman but um uh, and then if you don't find like a, a way to survive that you move to Kabul so usually you don't just go straight from one point to the other point so these most of these people have a story have a story of this place and that was all this also means that once uh usually there, if there is like one or two years that you are away from your own house, you lose the kind of uh, connection that uh, uh, allows you to go back because most of these people are farmers and are working uh, a kind of like system in which you work That's for true, the, yes. owner, the landowner. And so basically, they, I mean, like you people that you see in these camps, they will not go back. Uh, uh, because they don't have anything to go back to. I mean, like, uh, the, I mean, actually, it's the, the interesting fact, actually, like, for example, this, this wall, uh, these, the, the, the 
the, the actual place, how it looks like. This actually looks similar to their village, to the village where they come from. Uh, uh, I've been, I have a picture here uh, of, uh, a, because they are obviously divided by ethnic people, by provenience, by like region of where they're coming from. But there is a camp of Helmand, the people coming from Helmand, that actually the camp, it looks like a slice of Helmand. Anyway, but like, so they, so what I'm trying to say is that they kind of like go by steps because they cannot find um, the, the way to survive. So, um, and, and because it's, or for example, because it's still dangerous. So, more, like, all, all people that also like come to Europe or try to come to Europe, or they again, they don't like do a direct line. Like some of these people have spent uh, years. Uh, um, working in, in Iran to make the money and it's kind of like you know it's not it's not like a line it's it's just a long really long story of displacement open. yes well so just for uh, uh, I think may help understanding the scale there are 54 camps in Kabul okay and they're no humanitarian organizations I mean okay we're stepping out photography now but just out of curiosity there is no humanitarian organization over there no, 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 there's plenty, there's plenty, but uh, there is not enough. I mean, uh, the, the UNHCR and uh, yeah, exactly. uh, the yeah, Refugee camp, uh, Council and the Danish Refugee Council, they're all active, but you know, it, it's, it's uh, a crisis of gigantic proportions. So um, um, it's, it's, I think it's really interesting to say that, like, you know, the government, but even the, the, the organization like IOM and uh, UNHCR uh, are uh, cautious of helping the refugees too much. That are, there are various reasons for this. One is like, you see that if you give, I mean, what happened is to them, like actually somebody from IOM was telling me, uh, if you see that, ha that um, if they see that like, uh, uh, they are giving so much help to, um, to refugees uh, to the point that they have a better lifestyle than they were having when they were back home. You are kind of feeling that you are encouraging uh, the, the migration. And, and, and also the, the Afghan government have problem with this situation because, you know, a lot of these camps is government land that, well, you know, they are, they never going to go back. They are, they are, well, I mean, so the idea is like, what are we doing with these people? I mean, like the Helmand camp that I was uh, talking about before is being there for 10 years. Um, and like, you need to provide education, electricity, obviously you don't, they don't. But like, that would be, you know, you should provide services to these people. But their fear is that if we do, then more people is going to come. So that's kind of like, you know, the logic behind this whole idea of, you know, mm -hmm. Just so a tiny also, detour, uh, just a tiny detour on this, and then we move to the, the next is also that, I mean, imagine you've seen the living conditions, so you can imagine what is happening now with the spreading of the virus. Yeah. Yes, definitely. The thing is that no one will know. Definitely. Yeah. I have also a photography question related photography. So how safe is it for someone to come with his camera uh, and take pictures, uh, not only in Kabul, for example, uh, I was thinking about going to Korengal Valley, where Tim Hetherton was, to the villages yeah. in Korengal Valley. So yeah. I don't know how, how feasible is this, you know, to take my camera and a guide, of course, to go to Korengal Valley and meet these people over there now that things that, uh, you know, the America, the US Army is not over there anymore, I'm guessing. Okay. Um... Okay. So it's uh, so the security in terms of photography really depends, or in terms of traveling for for journalists, uh, it, it, it really depends from uh, the specific place uh, and the specific route that you're gonna take to go and come back. So um, in Afghanistan, there are places that are relatively safe, but the road is really um, uh, dangerous, uh, or there are places that are just controlled by the Taliban. So unless the Taliban welcome you, you cannot go there. Uh, as far as I know, Korengar is a place that is controlled by the Taliban now. So if you want to go there, uh, you need 
to talk to them and ask them if they take you. Um, um, otherwise, there are places, uh, but again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I never been there, I don't know that specific mm -hmm. place, it's a particularly uh, remote place, really close to the Pakistani border. Um, but in general, like what you do is like you, you talk to the, um, to, to the journalists, you talk to the local authorities, and you try to assess if you are gonna, um, first of all, if this is a territory controlled by the Taliban, and so in general, you don't, you cannot do that. Um, uh, if it's not the territory controlled by them, it can be uh, still uh, contested by them. That means they are fighting, or that means that sometimes it's controlled by them. And then some, and then the other problem is the roads, uh, because uh, because uh, the roads, um, because sometimes the the Taliban put on checkpoints in certain roads, even if they don't control that territory, or uh, uh, yeah. So, and obviously the other big problem of working in a place like that is the time that you can spend there. Uh, team was spent months in, uh, in Koranga because it was uh, on, uh, on embed with, with the American soldiers and they were uh, obviously providing air travel to get there and go back. And, and um, if you go there now, for sure you're not going to stay over. For no short or not going to stay for like months. Um, so I think th those questions are very time bound because the situation yeah. is so volatile that what is true to today may not be true tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. these are not things that can be planned much in advance. You need to have a proper network on the ground of people you actually trust and have reliable information because uh, one day is something and the, day, uh, the next day may be the opposite because the situation, especially in more remote and um, contested areas, is really volatile. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. So, like, yeah, the... the, the in general, but yeah, it is true, but in general, the problem of working the provinces is time. I mean, uh, because the main uh, uh, risk that there is now is kidnapping or just uh, general uh, activities by uh, thieves or people uh, that are not necessarily linked to the Taliban, but are, um, they want to steal your money, they want to kidnap you. This kind of stuff. So this is the main, uh, the main danger. Obviously, the other danger is uh, uh, is the, 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 the bombs that are put that are put on, on the, along the main roads by the Taliban to target the the DNA. But uh, obviously, if you are in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's a problem. And of course, the fighting between the two. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, the the, the kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, what I can do now, since we are like, you know, linking, this is the, I wanted to show you the, the, the story that has been awarded by uh, the World Press Photo this year uh, in the category Contemporary Issues. And it's, um, so what, what, what I did is I uh, assembled this story out of three different um, assignments that I did, I mean, two, two assignments and a story that I did uh, that you saw before with Francesca. Uh, so this, um, uh, so with the thanks or like with the Washington Post or thanks to the Washington Post, uh, me and uh, the and Susanna George, that is the bureau chief of the Washington Post in Kabul, we were given uh, authorization by the Taliban to uh, visit them in the eastern region uh, that is called Nangahar um, and uh, for, a, for a series of reasons, of course, that was, um, that was uh, around October last year um, and, uh, and what happened is uh, the Taliban and uh, uh, Americans were negotiating uh, for uh, a deal kind of okay, that can end the world among them, between them, uh, not including the, 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 the Afghan government, obviously, but so possibly the Taliban were um, more open to journalists because they obviously at the moment they are trying to rebuild, uh, to build more of a public image of this group. So they took us around their mountains and 
<laughs> you can see this is the white flag at the top. Um, and so, uh, so in this, in this, um, this work, what I wanted to do is to kind of like, you know, since I had this uh, incredible access, I wanted to kind of like show a bit of what's happened on the side of the Taliban and then show what, a bit of what happened on the other side, the fight the, 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 the people that they are fighting. This is, um, this is one of the Taliban that was killed in Azaram. Uh, and this is the, these are the two big uh, commanders uh, that were welcoming us and, uh, and this is their hideout in the mountains. This is the uh, party uh, that is a, is a, how you call it? Uh, it's, a, it's a wooden heater. And this is uh, again them, the, this is the Taliban parading their, their weaponry. Um, they, um, so uh, of course, this uh, was. Uh, taking over one single day because when you do something like that you cannot over um say uh, overnight to them uh, because of uh, many reasons but one of the reasons is also the the american aspects uh of course staying and standing between a big number of uh, of taliban seats especially in the open uh or going on a pickup trap with them is uh, it's a big risk in terms of uh, of uh, air strikes, uh, drone drone strikes. It's uh, um, actually there. there the, 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 the Taliban themselves usually they don't walk around because like they were you know, there. Everything went all right. And then this is uh, the other side. So this is the ANA, as you call the Afghan National Army. Um, this is a group of. Uh, this is a unit that every day comes. Uh, go out of the uh, uh, in the morning. They go out of the, their base and kind of like clean the road from uh, IEDs, from uh, uh, road bombs that uh, the Afghans, the, the, the Taliban, uh, put during the night. And this is they are like uh, they are exploring one of the bombs that they found. Um, and and this is kind of like you know how it looks from the other side. Like every day, uh, and this is uh, this is Highway One that is the main. Uh, ring road that uh, kind of link Afghanistan, and uh, it's it's a it's a really dangerous road, and and uh, yeah, you, as you can see, they don't you, you you can see in the background there are like trucks and stuff. They just blow stuff without even closing the road. They didn't even think of closing the road before. And and this is uh, an outpost where of the of the police. Uh, these these images with the ANA were taken in Ghazni, that is more central Afghanistan, while the, the picture of the Taliban were taken in in uh, Nangarhar in the Philippines. And um, and then I put a section about the civilians. Uh, so these are images that were also a part of the story that I showed you before, but were like a kind of chosen to be here. And so the idea was like showing the Taliban, showing the ANA and showing the civilians who are in the middle that have to deal with these, uh, with the consequences of, of the, the fighting. This is, uh, everybody is showing me their uh, shrapnel wounds or gun wounds, and these, these are civilians. So these are people that have not been fighting actively. They were uh, most likely near some explosion that happened. And, uh, and this is taken in, in Kabul. Uh, uh, Again, and this is the last one. Yes, this is the last. Yes, so this is again uh, the entrance of a of a um, uh, of a house, mud house in a in a refugee camp in in, uh, in Kabul. Actually, I think Francesco was standing this right yeah. next to me. Right next to me. <laughs> Yes. I think we can take a couple of pictures, uh, a couple of pictures, a couple of questions. And, oh, for uh, sure. Yeah, for sure.